right, so again, uh, welcome to Live from Noir Lab at Gemini. My name is Jamika. I'm one of the uh, one of an out one of the outreach assistants here at the International Gemini Observatory, and I am very pleased to have you all today. Um, you will be hosted by two amazing people. First, uh, you'll have Peter Michaud, who has our community engage, uh, engagement and education here at the International Gemini Observatory. And he will be joined by Jesse Ball, who manages the operations team. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. You can message me directly so I can ask your question or Peter and Jesse uh, will pause to uh, receive your questions um, throughout the presentation. And if there are no questions from uh, our visitors, I will move it over to Peter. Peter? Hey. <laughs> Thanks, Jamika. I don't know, can people see me as well or just my slides right now? Okay. <laughs> oh, we can see you too. Okay, welcome everybody. And as I understand it, um, the REU program is all virtual this year, correct? So you folks are kind of spread all over the country, is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's true. Okay, okay, yep. great, great. Well, it's, it's, uh, I, I wish I could meet you a little bit uh, uh, more personally, uh, but uh, for now, we'll um, uh, appreciate you all being here and uh, got a lot that uh, I'd like to share with you. And uh, Jesse has kindly agreed to join us as well and chime in when I say something incorrect or, or if he adds something to add, which he will undoubtedly because he brings a lot of experience uh, in the operations of, of an observatory like Gemini. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start off by showing you a few slides to give you some background information. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much um, you know about Gemini or um, I, I'm guessing if you're part of the REU program, you have a pretty good understanding of astronomy, physics, and the science of, of what we do. Um, but uh, I'll give you a little background information and sort of an insider's look at uh, some of the things that we do at Gemini. And again, if you have any questions as we go through, you can send Jamika a, a note, a chat note, or um, um, ideally, if just raise your hand or, or, or turn on your microphone and say something. Um, I think we've got a small enough group that we can keep it uh, fairly, fairly informal today. So um, let's see if I can make this work. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So I just wanted to start off with a, an animation, a time-lapse animation showing the Gemini dome at night pointing to different parts of the sky as the night goes by. First part of that was by moonlight. And now we're looking at the Milky Way over in the darkness. Now we'll go inside the telescope and it looks like daytime in this uh, time-lapse, but it's actually nighttime. This is under a full moon. Um, the sky's blue at night uh, when the moon's up, in case you didn't know that. Yeah, most of us don't have sensitive, uh, sensitive enough eyes to see that, but with a time-lapse photo like the uh, sequence like this, you can see uh, the blue sky because the same light gets scattered by the moon as gets, uh, by the same moonlight gets scattered by the atmosphere as, as the sun. Um, and so now we're ending, ending the night and as a full moon, as soon as, as soon as a full moon sets, the sun comes up. And then we're back where we started again. Okay. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, Mauna Kea as a, um, oh, a place to study the stars, why it's such an exceptional place to study the stars. And we'll get back to this time lapse in a few minutes, so I'm going to skip over this for now. Um, the two Gemini telescopes, uh, called Gemini because we're named after the twins, the constellation in the zodiac, right? Um, and so we have two twin telescopes, one of them here in Hawaii in the middle of the Pacific, the other one in Chile. Um, and uh, collectively, these two telescopes can see on both sides of the equator, so we see both hemispheres of the sky. Um, we're going to focus today, because uh, Jesse and I are, are here in Hawaii, uh, we're going to focus on, on the Hawaii aspect of it, but as we talk about the Gemini North Telescope in Hawaii, the Gemini South Telescope uh, is, um, in terms of the telescope, is essentially identical. Um, the instrumentation is a little different, and some of the circumstances are different and whatnot, and the conditions can be very different, but uh, we're going to focus on Hawaii. And here you can see the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, we're located on the um, lower right on the Big Island, uh, or Hawaii Island. Um, we're going to zoom in a little bit closer and just talk about some of the characteristics of the place that we're located. Um, 
you can see this is a satellite view on an exceptionally clear day on the Big Island. We don't get too many of those. Um, in fact, Hilo, the city that we're coming to you from, uh, is the wettest city in the U.S. We get about 150 inches of rain a year. And you may say, well, if it's so wet, why would you build an observatory near there? Um, and actually what happens is that um, the moisture builds up over Hilo and dumps on us so that the top of the mountain can be dry and pristine. And so it's a happy uh, circumstance between, uh, in terms of the weather on the Big Island. Um, what you see here, um, the two white spots on this uh, image of the Big Island are the summit areas of Mauna Kea at the top and Mauna Loa, uh, um, down on the lower part of, of the island. Um, the reason they're white is because they're covered with snow. Uh, we get snow for oh, four or five months during the winter time, um, typically November or so up until April or May, um, we can have snow on, on the mountain. And you don't usually think of snow in Hawaii, but uh, we get plenty of it up on the mountain. Uh, and I think Jesse can tell us a little bit more about that uh, as well. Jesse, you, you've been up there during um, weather events and had to deal with that, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. It gets it gets really slick up there, and I'm I'm actually from northern Minnesota, so I know what snow is like, and it gets pretty extreme up there. I've had, I know I've had one circumstance where we were trying to evacuate on time, but the black ice built up so quickly that we uh, we slid to the side of the road and had to trek back up to the observatory and wait until uh, rangers could come up and help us out. So it it gets pretty treacherous up there, and and it's no joke. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a closer look at some of the extreme weather on the mountain in a, in a few minutes. The other feature that I wanted to talk about on this image here is if you look down towards the right hand side, a little bit below the center, you'll see sort of a reddish glow there. Uh, that represents the Kilauea volcano. Although we don't have any active lava flows now, uh, if you've been following at all the volcanic activity on the Big Island, you know that uh, a year and a half, two years ago, we had a lot of activity uh, and um, some 700 houses were destroyed by lava. Um, so that can be another um, um, obstacle <laughs> living here on the Big Island. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later too. But uh, normally we'd be coming to you from this building. This is our headquarters in Hilo at University Park at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Um, you can tell it rains a lot because we've got the ever-present rainbow up there over the top of our building. You also see that we've got um, a number of flags in the front. We're an international partnership. And so that uh, all of those flags are represented um, in, in front of the building. That includes the United States, Canada, Aust uh, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile, uh, and Korea, uh, and Canada. Did, I think I mentioned that. Um, and so um, um, astronomers from all over the world uh, can use uh, our telescopes to do their research. Again, we have two telescopes, one in the Northern Hemisphere, one in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, this is not to scale, just in case you were wondering. Um, and um, uh, this illustrates why, how we can see the entire sky between the two telescopes being on both sides of uh, both sides of the equator. We also get a time zone advantage where either six or seven uh, hours away, depending on daylight savings time. And so there are instances where we can start observing a rapidly changing object in the sky um, and then continue observing with the other telescope um, uh, when that so it gives us a better better time coverage. Jesse, do you know of any examples where we've done that recently, or um, is that something that? Uh, that... Um, I can't think of any specific examples off the top of my head, but it's certainly possible and doable. Mm -hmm. And I know we've done it in the past with with um, yeah with objects that may be setting um, for the telescope in the south and just rising in the north or something like yeah. that. So, you know, transient type events, um, things that um, it, it also allows us, for example, when we get a, a trigger for like a, 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 the optical component of a gamma ray burst or something like that, um, then we have a better chance of, of spotting it, having the, the coverage and time of both telescopes. And uh, that's one of the things also that makes Gemini unique is that we can observe things on rapid turnaround. Uh, if some event gets triggered, um, 
we can drop everything and uh, observe those objects. And that's something I know Jesse deals with all the time as well, uh, is those targets of opportunity that, that, that pop up in the middle of the night. <laughs> Yeah, they can be they can be quite exciting. Yeah, we basically just drop what we're doing, and and slew the telescope right to that object and see what we can pick up. And you know we've gotten some we've gotten some pretty good data um, out of that. Some pretty um, groundbreaking stuff. Yeah, so things like the optical component of a of a, of a gamma ray burst and things like that, or, or um, FRBs and things of that sort. So anyway, well. Um, dive into that a little bit more too. I did want to show a pretty picture of Gemini South too. Um, normally we don't like to show pictures of the observatory with clouds in the sky, uh, but this was particularly striking and uh, they assured me that it did clear up that night. So um, it's not uh, indicative of what the weather was on that night. But uh, so Gemini South is located on a mountain called Cerro Pechon in Chile. Um, and it's not as high as Mauna Kea. Cerro Pichon is about 8,000 feet, um, or 8,500, I think, uh, high, and um, but in um, basically in a desert, and so uh, we get uh, extremely um, um, fine conditions up there on Cerro Pichon. It's very close to Cerro Tololo uh, Inter-American Observatory, um, uh, about a half hour drive from there, so um, on a dirt road. Um, okay, this is the uh, sequence here. This is a sequence that, that actually I took oh, many, many years ago uh, from Mauna Loa looking over at Mauna Kea, uh, starting at about 10 in the morning and showing the clouds and how the weather develops during the day. As the island warms up, the clouds begin to form and actually rise up the mountain. And so by mid-afternoon, a lot of times, these clouds will have risen up and cover the summit area of the mountain. Um, this was a particularly stable day and you can see what's called the inversion layer, which is where the clouds kind of stop. And typically that's about 9,000 feet. And at night that will sink down as the island cools. And now the moon is gonna come up soon and light things up so you can see things. Uh, there we go. And you can see the clouds say, staying down low. Uh, you can see some vehicles going up and down the mountain uh, uh, from visitors or uh, maybe astronomers, but typically the astronomers would be in place by then observing and uh, studying the sky. So um, this, let me start, whoops, go back from the beginning of this one one more time. This illustrates a number of things about Mauna Kea and why Mauna Kea is such a great place for observing the sky. One, uh, we're usually above the clouds. About 80% of the time, the inversion layer stays below the summit. Uh, also, the air is very, very dry at that elevation and very stable. We don't get a lot of turbulence overhead. Uh, the same sort of turbulence you'd feel in an airplane as warm air mixes with cold air uh, causes the stars to twinkle, as I'm sure you're aware, or what astronomers call seeing. And um, uh, the seeing is very good on Mauna Kea and allows us to do things that uh, really we can't do from any place else on the Earth for, for, a, for a telescope like Gemini. Now we are located, as I said before, on a very um, act, geologically active place. Uh, we have active volcanoes that have been going on uh, for years and years here on the Big Island, Kilauea. Um, in fact, Mauna Kea is a long dormant um, volcano. It's not extinct yet. It's been uh, inactive for about 4,500 years. Um, and so we feel pretty confident being there. However, Mauna Loa, just across the way from Mauna Kea, um, has been active more recently. In fact, uh, there was a flow in 1984 that got to within about five miles of Hilo. Um, and so um, both mountains uh, will undoubtedly be active again at some point, but uh, Mauna Kea shows no sign of becoming active anytime soon. So we feel quite confident being able to invest in observatories on um, Mauna Kea. Um, Peter? And, yeah. May I ask a question here? Uh, it's a perfect spot. This is from uh, Corinna. Corinna asks, are the, um, are the earthquakes in Chile not a problem for the telescope down at Gemini South? Uh, I wouldn't say they're not a problem. There's something, uh, actually in both sites, we get a lot of um, uh, earthquake activity. Um, and we actually have um, 
oh, earthquake restraints on the telescope that keep it from shifting um, an awful lot. I don't know, Jesse, if you want to add anything, if you've had any experiences with earthquakes. Um, at, well, at yeah, I mean, aside from the structural, you know, things we can we can put in, there's not much we can do about earthquakes. And, and you're right, we get them both in Hawaii and Chile. And, and after big earthquakes, it takes um, a lot of uh, a lot of effort from from a big crew of of experts to you know go and look at, at at things and the systems and make sure everything is still intact and and the integrity of all the systems are, are preserved we can actually see in a, the trace of our secondary mirror it's it's a very it's almost like a seismometer you can see the earthquake um, happen in in the trace of of the secondary mirrors um, XY stage um, the lateral translation of it you can see it shaking um, so you can you can kind of tell how big the earthquake is based on the based on some of our monitoring systems as well but yeah it, uh, it, 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 it de definitely affects us and and there have been instances where we've been shut down for weeks or months because we had to recover from a bigger yep. okay I think your mic went off there Jesse but I think okay yeah that was it sorry I, I muted because there's uh, somebody mowing the lawn in the background here I don't oh, know. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, again, we get pretty extreme weather up on the mountain, as uh, Jesse was was telling us about. Uh, this is actually a view from 2011, but uh, pretty much every winter we'll have views like this. If you want to monitor this, go to some of the webcams on Mauna Kea. If you just Google Mauna Kea webcams, uh, you, you'll get all kinds of views of the mountain, and you can see. Um, what the, what the weather is doing at that particular time. Uh, this is after a big winter storm, uh, and we're actually looking at the parking, where we would park our vehicles, uh, which when this picture was taken would not be possible. We do have snow plows in Hawaii and snow blowers and big industrial trucks that will come in and clear things out. Because oftentimes after we get a big storm like this in the winter time, the uh, atmosphere will get nice and dry and stable for a while and so we want to be on the sky as quickly as possible and one of the things that happens is that there'll be a call to staff to go out and shovel snow off the dome so that we can open up the dome and we don't have icicles falling on the mirror <laughs> and jesse i'm guessing that's something you've done in the past too is oh yeah anytime i get a chance i'll go up there it reminds me of back home in minnesota <laughs> but it's it's great exercise up there too because you have so much less oxygen at 14,000 and feet so it's uh yeah it's it's fun put it that yeah, way. that's a good point we never mentioned that uh, Mauna Kea is at about 14,000 feet which is above about 40 percent of the atmosphere and that means that 40 percent of the atmospheric pressure uh, is gone too and so you don't have as much pressure pushing the oxygen into your blood and so your body um, it, it's tough to work up there it's tough to think up there uh, and Jesse's crew um, um, back in the old days used to do all of our observations from uh, up on the mountain which was um, a very different experience than now because now uh, we operate and we we run all of our observations from sea level, which is the background that Jesse has right now. Uh, unfortunately, that facility is, is only open for our nighttime observing, um, but that's what it looks like if, if Jesse were there at night uh, making observations from sea level, which make, again, is a lot easier to think than at 14,000 feet. Anybody have any questions at this point? Um, or? You can type them in, or if you want to try turning on your microphone, that's fine too. We can give that a shot. Is there anyone that stays up at the observatory doing maintenance or anything, or is it mostly like so, no one's up there unless something's needed? Well, like Peter was saying, we used to. Um, th there's nobody that stays there. Like uh, there's no there's no sleeping facility at the fourteen thousand foot level. There are there are dorms kind of at the nine thousand foot level where we call Hale Pohaku. Um, and when we used to when we used to observe from the summit at night, we the the night crew would stay in those dorms during the daytime and sleep, and then and come up to the observatory at night. Um, now that we are operating remotely from Hilo at night, our night operations is in this control room that that's by virtual background, but that's the walls there that you can see show us what the sky looks like, and then we can monitor all the systems. It, the control room looks almost identical to what it does up on the on the summit, but during the daytime. Um, we do have day crew 
um, technicians um, for maintenance and, and development and projects that um, engineers that go up during the day to keep the telescope in top shape and then they'll come down that same day. They usually work 10 hour days four times a week. Also, because of COVID, we've got a minimum staff going up the mountain right now. I think what it's four or five people a day, I think, going up to maintain things. Four, four per day at this point, um, but we have the capacity to send more if we have a bigger project or something like that. So they're just doing ba basic maintenance and making sure everything's working uh, when we get on the sky at night. Uh, but when we open up the dome at night, um, there's nobody on the mountain. It's all done remotely from Hilo. So um, it's kind of a big leap of faith. <laughs> when we uh, uh, when we started operating remotely and not having anybody on the mountain, um, but we've got a lot of monitoring systems and uh, uh, we know exactly what's happening in and around the telescope. Um, for example, if the relative humidity gets above about 80%, we have to shut everything down because we don't want water condensing on the optical surfaces of the telescope. And without having somebody there, we need a lot of remote sensing so that we know exactly what's happening so that we don't uh, miss that. Yeah, and in, in fact, not, not only just to monitor, like the operations staff, we sit down in the control room and monitor those conditions, like Peter said, but we also have sensors that will automatically trip in certain conditions and close the telescope itself. For example, if we lose our network connection or if it starts precipitating, actually raining, not just fog, or if there's an earthquake that's over a certain magnitude, the facility will just close itself down and put itself in a state, safe state um, until somebody can get up to the summit. Any more questions at this point or thoughts? Okay. Uh, again, if you have one, don't don't hesitate to interrupt. And let's just take a quick look here at what the mountain looks like after we get a snowstorm from a little closer to sea level, uh, from some pasture lands down below. Um, the, one of the things that, that um, tourists used to do, not so much anymore, but is to surf in the morning and ski in the afternoon. Uh, we don't encourage skiing on the mountain. It's uh, very dangerous and not super respectful to the mountain itself. And the, uh, the Mauna Kea is culturally a very sensitive uh, and important site for um, Hawaiians and, and everybody really that, that, that uses the mountain. It's a very special place and we like to keep it that way. Um, and, and as you can see, very beautiful uh, when we um, at, under any conditions, but uh, when we get a snowfall like this, uh, one of the things that happens is a lot of people will go up with their pickup trucks and bring um, uh, a load of snow down for the kids to play with. And um, so you see a lot of trucks coming down the mountain with uh, streams of water com coming out the back as it melts in the tropical heat. But <laughs> the snow snowmen don't last very long in Hilo. <laughs> and so this is uh, what things look like from the inside um, on a typical night uh, after the sun goes down. And maybe Jesse, you could just tell us a little bit about the sequence of events that happens once the sun goes down and we need to get on the sky and start observing. Yeah, sure. So, so you can see in this picture a good illustration of how it starts off. Um, we open those those vent gates on the side and the shutter as wide and open as we possibly can. Um, and that's to get the air outside, the temperatures outside to equalize with the temperatures inside. Um, we have we have air conditioners that run all day and they keep the dome actually colder than it is outside usually. Um, they keep it at about the temperature where, where it is at midnight on an average night. Um, and so when we open the dome, we're actually releasing or we're letting heat in rather than letting it out. But but all those all the structures in there have their own thermal emission. All the electronics have plenty of thermal emission. So any kind of temperature differences we get can contribute to the the image quality. So we need to flush. We call it flushing out the dome by opening it up as wide as we can, given the wind speeds and the conditions. Um, and then once once we, and we do that right around sunset. And then, um, and then before we start taking any science, um, 
we do what's called tuning. Um, I think I can skip ahead here. Uh, let me just skip over these real quick, Jesse, and we can t continue that once I uh, get through these slides here. This is just a picture of the telescope under the night sky. This picture was actually taken by rotating the dome. So it looks like the dome is invisible and you can see the whole telescope. Normally you wouldn't see it like that. <laughs> um, we have our cloaking technology engaged on that one. Um, but Jesse, maybe you can just talk a little bit about the control screen and then we can go to that next one that, to, that talks about tuning. Okay, sure. Yeah, well, um, th this is actually, this is what it's called our TSD, our telescope status display. And it's, it's not an interactive software, but it's where we, where, when we're operating and observing, we keep track of pretty much all, all the different systems all at once. And you can see, um, well, I don't know how self-explanatory it is, but you can see there's a lot of information on there. Um, on the left, you, you see a picture of, or a, a schematic of where our target is. That's the little orange, tight, the smaller orange circle with the, with the tracking, um, tracking into the setting west there. And then the dotted outline is the actual, the, the primary mirror, the telescope itself. And then you can see kind of the small slits around the outside are the vent gates and the domes. Um, you can also see on the left the image of, um, you know, a kind of a schematic of the telescope itself. There are four different instruments. If you see underneath there, it says GMOS, AO, NERI, and then I think the bottom of it is cut off, but it probably said NIFS. Those are some of the different instruments, and we can use, um, well, we can use three or four oh, different that's in, the, that's in the center, in the center bottom there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry, underneath the... The schematic towards the right hand side um, so yeah we can use several different instruments on any given night um, up to four um, and even we, we can even feed fibers from other telescopes um, instruments to use our mirror um, and we, we typically will um, I don't know is this a good time to get into what the Q observing is Peter sure, or do you... sure. yeah no. okay Perfect. So, so you know, we keep track of all the, the health of all the different systems on the telescope and all the instruments here on, on screens like this and different information. But the way that, that we observe at Gemini is a little bit different than, than the way they observe at some of the other uh, telescopes like, uh, like Keck and, and other places where they have classical observing. Classical observing is where if you're a, a research astronomer, you apply for time on, any, on a telescope and then you get awarded like two or three nights and you come out to the site or you log in remotely and then you have those two or three nights no matter what. But with, um, with Gemini and with some other big telescopes across the world, they operate in a Q-based system. So if you're the researching scientist and you apply for time and you get awarded time, you'll get awarded X number of hours and in these types of conditions. So you have to request based on what your science needs are like, if I, if you, can you take some clouds? If it's bright objects, then then you can request it's okay to have clouds. If you can't, you can say we don't have any clouds. So you get a word of time based on whatever conditions your science needs. Um, and on any given night, the operations team, that's my team, we will go through a queue of what needs to get done and what conditions we're in. And um, we'll go and observe with three or four different instruments on any given night and, and take data for the top ranked programs um, in the given weather conditions that we have. So it's a little bit different and you're, it's, it's a lot more efficient um, at collecting data that way because you will get good data no matter what the conditions are unless we have to close. Um, whereas with classical observing, you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily get that. You'd, you'd be at the, the whim of the luck of what weather you get. And if we don't get the data, then we can try again the next night doing it that way or a subsequent night uh, until we get the data. So if it's a highly ranked program, you're guaranteed to get your data under the very best conditions. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And and even though we don't always have the observers here in the control room, um, you know, if you are a researcher, you always have the option to to chime in with a program we call eavesdropping and you can just zoom in at night. We'll give you a call when your data is being taken if you request it. and. Um, and, and you can, you know, see your data being taken live if, if you like. So, so we're expecting that you guys, the REU students, to someday be our users uh, to take this experience to the next level where you're actually um, joining with, our, with Jesse and his crew to get, to get your data. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Is this, Jesse, uh, this is what we were getting to, though. So, uh, the sequence was a little off, but you were talking about how at the beginning of the night we, we calibrate or tune the mirror, yeah? 
Yeah, so so this is, um, I, Peter, you might know the exact dimensions better than I do off the top of my head, but it's a very big mirror, and for how wide, and you know, eight meters wide in diameter, and for how wide it is, it's only a, a few inches thick, right? It's like four. Yeah, it's about eight inches, or eight. 10 inches thick, uh, about 24 tons of, of ceramic glass material. So, uh, yeah, can't, oh, it, the mirror cannot support its own weight, basically. It's very, it's very thin for, for how big it is, but it's also very flexible. So um, there are a couple different uh, things we use to, to keep it in shape. Um, as it moves, as the mirror moves in, in elevation, in, in angle, basically, as, as gravity vectors differ on different parts of the mirrors, we have to, we have to bend the mirror with, with that to keep its shape. Um, you know it's pretty much a, a, a hyperbola and we need to we need to keep that shape the same so that it, st it the image quality stays the same so there are um there are pressurized airbags underneath there are also pneumatic uh, actuators that bend the mirror as we move it in elevation um, but not only that we can also tune the shape based on what the atmosphere is doing in any given time um, of the night and the way we do that is we have um, what we call wavefront sensors, and I think um, in a couple slides, Peter will get into what the atmosphere, you know, how the atmosphere <clears> is. is yeah, what, what Jesse's talking about is what we call active optics, yeah, and, and, and it makes corrections on the order of what, every 30 seconds or something like that. It, 10 um, to 30 seconds, yeah, I think there are some corrections that go in every 10 seconds, some that every 30 seconds, but it's pretty slow relative to, relative to some of the aberrations in the atmosphere. Um, but yeah, so we, 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 we tune the, the, there are lots of different optical aberrations and I could get into a whole, <laughs> a whole chapter on that. But, but, but just warned me before we started that he could talk about this for an hour. So we yeah. might have to cut him off. Yeah. And it's fine, <laughs> just cut me off if you need to. But, but so I'll try to, I'll try to compact it into, into something simple as we, we use wavefront sensors, which are basically tiny little, uh, telescopes or optics, I guess, that, that, that put spots on a, on a CCD on, and it's reading out at 200 times a second and giving us an idea of how the atmosphere is changing. And then we can tune the mirror to shape for, um, for example, if there's some certain coma, um, then we can, we can move the secondary laterally to correct for coma. And if there's some astigmatism, we can, we can bend the primary mirror um, to, to correct for that astigmatism. And we can sometimes do that as we're observing, um, but with some of the higher order aberrations, we just tune them out at the beginning of the night and get a, a pretty decent shape and then add that to the top of our gravity model. And, and it's kind of the mirror is constantly bending and flexing throughout the whole night. But both the primary mirror that Peter shows here, but also the secondary mirror that, that sits above it. So yeah, the, 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 the systems all have to work together. It's sort of this very intricate dance that happens, keeping everything aligned and um, keeping the mirror shaped. To give you a sense of the precision that's necessary for, for a mirror of this sort to get the resolution that, that, that we get with a telescope like Gemini, um, we're talking about on the order of somewhere between one one thousandth and one ten thousandth the thickness of a human hair uh, accuracy over the whole surface of the mirror. Uh, that's a fraction of, I think it's a one twentieth of a wave of a wavelength of green light, um, in order to, to to get the the type of resolution that, that that an eight meter mirror is is capable of. Of course, we've got a lot of things that are that are getting in the way of that, like the Earth's atmosphere. So we'll talk a little bit about that later too. But what Jesse's talking about here again is just to, for terminology purposes is called active optics. Uh, there's another type of correction at a, at a much higher order that is called adaptive optics and it happens more frequently and I'm going to tell you about that in a, in a few minutes but um, at this Here. point we're going to yeah can I jump in here with a question yeah. before you move on to adaptive yeah. optics um, this is from Linnea um, Jesse you talked about um, op uh, the, uh, getting the dome temperature down to the expected nighttime temperature and so Linnea asked what temperature is that exactly that we would bring the, t the dome down to yeah fair enough I thanks Linnea I saw your question I was just typing as uh, uh, an answer to it as, as you answered but um, yeah so um, it, it it's typically, I would say, 
I mean, I could go look at the data and, and give you an exact temperature, but it's it's probably around zero degrees C, um, plus or minus one or two degrees that we try to keep it at. Um, in the winter, it can get you know close to minus eight, minus ten. This is Celsius, um, not Fahrenheit. And in the summer, it gets up to plus ten. So um, typically during the day, our air conditioners keep it at about freezing. Okay, great. Um, let's dive into a little bit of some of the types of observations that we make. And then, like I said, I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, adaptive optics in particular. Again, differentiating between what Jesse was just talking about with the active optics. This is one of my favorite observations that, Jupiter, that, that uh, Gemini has made of the planet Saturn and its moon Titan. You can see the moon Titan down there at about 6.30, 7 o'clock uh, position. Uh, and one of the reasons this one's so special to me is when I was a young kid, uh, teenager, um, I got my first telescope. And uh, when I first looked through the, like most people, when you get a telescope, you look at Saturn because it's so beautiful. And it is. Um, and it just got me hooked for life on uh, astronomy and just the, the, the beauty of what's out there in space. And so back then with my little six inch telescope, looking at Saturn. Uh, you could see the moons, but they were just little pinpoints of light. You couldn't see anything like this. You could see the rings and you could see a little bit of the subdivisions in the rings and some of the weather and the clouds if you looked real carefully when the atmosphere was behaving itself and very stable. Um, but now with telescopes like Gemini using adaptive optics, we can get resolutions that in some cases can even exceed the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope is a relatively small telescope, 2.4 meters across or eight meters across. So we can do things Hubble can't do and Hubble can do things we can't do. So we work together, we complement each other very well. And I'm gonna show you an example of that when we close out the program today of some Jupiter observations that, that Gemini and Hubble work together on. Uh, but for now, Saturn, um, and um, if we zoom in on Saturn's moon Titan, let's do that, we can see something like that. And this is an observation that was made showing a storm in the clouds of Titan. So we can actually monitor the weather on a satellite of, of, of Saturn's moons, uh, which I find just amazing. Like I said, you know, if you're using an amateur's telescope, an amateur sized telescope, that's just going to be a little pinpoint of light. That's all you're going to see. Uh, but with these technologies like adaptive optics, we can zoom in basically and see details that were unheard of, um, you know, decades ago um, with before this technology came along. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about adaptive optics. I'll try to get through this fairly quickly because we're going to run out of time here if I don't. Um, but if you are looking at light, the wa wave, what are called wave fronts of light coming from an object in space, um, they would be entering the Earth's atmosphere and be perfectly flat. They're a little curved in this illustration. Not completely accurate. Uh, <laughs> when they get to the atmosphere, um, we have pockets of warm air and cold air. The cold air is dense, the warm air is less dense, and so the index of refraction, you guys are physics students, so I'm guessing you know these terms, the index of refraction is different uh, for cold air and uh, warm air. And so the, the wave front gets bent. And that's what you see here as the air goes through the Earth's atmosphere, it gets bent. Again, we feel that same thing in a jet airplane bumping around when the turbulence gets really bad because the cold pockets of air are more dense and you bounce around a little bit. Starlight bounces around too. Um, and that's what happens is that wave front gets bent. And so we need to fix that. We need to get rid of those bends in the wave front and um, counteract that, um, those distortions. And so I have an animation here and I'm gonna sound like an auctioneer as we go through trying to narrate what's happening. So I'm gonna start the sequence. It starts off a little bit slow so I can build it, we can sort of work into it. But we use a laser guide star to help us do that. We don't absolutely need a laser guide star, but it allows us to see a lot more targets if we have a laser as a reference point to make the correction. So what happens here is that, well, we're going to open up the dome first and we're going to uh, get set, as Jesse was just describing, to observe uh, the sky. The vent gates are opening up and telescopes getting into position. And we're going to propagate a laser, a sodium laser. It's a yellow-orange laser. 
um, up into the sky. And so what's going to happen is the light's going to go up. It's going to go through what are called relay optics up to the top of the telescope and then go straight out up into, up into the sky. About 90 kilometers up, there's a layer of sodium. And that sodium was deposited by meteors uh, as they burn up in the atmosphere. That sodium light interacts with the sodium in that sodium layer, causes it to glow. We're looking at it from the side here. Looking at it from the telescope though, from the telescope's point of view, it looks like a point of light. It looks like a star, an artificial star, a laser guide star. We can put that anywhere in the sky. The joke I like to make is that there aren't enough stars in the sky for astronomers. They have to make their own. Uh, but we need something fairly bright and close to the object that we're looking at as a point of reference. So what happens is that light comes back down through the telescope again now, along with the object we're looking at, and it goes into our adaptive optics module, which is that just a, well, in here, in this view, just a generic box. And we're going to take a look at what happens inside that box. It's a bit of a simplistic view of an adaptive optics system, but shows you the basic systems. So that screen there is going to be what we're seeing for the data. So the light comes down, very slow light, not traveling at the speed of light, it goes through a collimator, a deformable mirror, a beam splitter, and then the red light, the infrared light goes down in, onto a detector and we see on the screen that you get a star image that's all blurry and moving around. The atmosphere is just raising, raising havoc with it. Now, if we looked at that light as what are called wave fronts, you see those wave, they look like potato chips. They've been bent by the Earth's atmosphere. If we were in space, those would be perfectly flat and you'd have a perfect image. So what we do is we take some of that light, the shorter wavelength light, and we analyze it and then send that to, to a deformable mirror, which gets just the right shape to flatten those potato chips out. Then that light goes back through and is focused on our detector. And once it gets there, the star goes from a, a blobby mess to a nice pinpoint image. That's how adaptive optics works in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> I hope that didn't go too fast, um, but uh, uh, we can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but this is a view here of the telescope during a full night of, of laser guide star observations. Uh, you can see over in the left, if you look real carefully, you can see the glow of sunset. Over on the right of this image, you can see the glow of sunrise. The moon is setting over towards the left. That's that big bright streak there. And uh, we're looking, uh, anybody tell me which direction we're looking just by, by, the, by the view? So. You didn't know there was going to be a pop quiz, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Good Peter. What's that? Is that a trick question, Peter? No, it's actually, no, it's, it's the type of thing that once I tell you, it's like, oh, okay, of course. Oh. <laughs> and you probably know this, but you're probably not turning on your mic. Look at the middle of the picture. Aaron, are you going to, no? I see, I see Aaron Liam up there. Says, Liam says north. Yeah. Ah, yes. Okay. Yeah, we're looking north um, because you can see the north star in the center of that circle there. The North Star is not exactly over the North Pole though, it's about a half degree away. So it makes this tiny little circle there. Uh, Polaris, anybody know the Hawaiian name for the North Star? Uh, no, none of our guys, none of our guys. Although, anybody know the Hawaiian name for, word for star? Hokupa'a? Ah, Hokupa'a, very good, okay. Hokupa'a means the unmoving star because it sits Eh, almost directly above the North Pole of the Earth. It does move a little bit, as we can see in this photo here. Anyway, that, that was a tangent. We'll move on. Uh, but uh, if, if, if nothing else, you'll have learned the Hawaiian name for the North Star today, Hokupa'a. Okay. Um, let's take a, look, take a look at something else that you can see in the sky. You're all familiar with this constellation, I imagine. Orion, and if you look at the, the three stars in a row below the, the, its belt, below its belt, you can see kind of a reddish looking glow down there. That's the Orion Nebula. It's a star forming region uh, and uh, one of the most beautiful star forming regions that we can see in our part of the Milky Way. We're going to zoom in on it. And there we go. Now through 
even an amateur sized telescope, you could probably get a picture similar to this. To the naked eye, it looks kind of like a greenish glow. You don't see a lot of color with uh, the naked eye or, or even through a, t a small telescope. Um, but if we keep zooming in, I think this is a Hubble view. We'll zoom in a little bit more. And we're going to take a look at an observation that Gemini made using adaptive optics, uh, looking at the very center of the Orion Nebula. And what's happening in the center of the Orion Nebula is that you have very large O-type stars that are being formed. And when they do, they give off uh, tremendous winds out into space. And so the star is forming over in the lower left. But if you look up, I don't know if we've got to zoom in a little closer. There we go. Uh, if you look up over towards the right of this image, um, you can see some sort of blue uh, uh, streaks or some blue blobs um, sort of at the tip of each one of those, those pillars of, of um, uh, what that is, is glowing gas. Uh, so what's happening is that those very massive stars that are forming in the lower left they're blowing off material, and actually the uh, material that they're blowing off, the clouds, have uh, vaporized iron in it. And that's what's causing those, those blue areas to glow at the tips of those little pillars that you see. And it's kind of like, a, we, we call this the Orion bullets, because they're kind of like bullets. They're being um, ejected at, at tremendous speeds and causing the neutral hydrogen gas, which normally wouldn't glow, causing it to glow because it heats it up and excites it. And so that's what we're seeing as those pillars there, sort of like tracers as this gas is ejected from these, these stars being born in the Orion Nebula. So um, in over a period of, of a few years or 10 years, when you, if you make observations, you can actually see them uh, visibly shifted in position over just a few years at this resolution. So it's um, really dynamic um, section, uh, section of the Orion Nebula and something that with adaptive optics uh, we can observe in great detail um, as, as, as we can see here. This is actually a mosaic of several pointings with the adaptive optics system. Another discovery of, uh, recently is something that we they were calling the mini moon. Uh, it's only a few meters across, a very small object that was detected. Gemini followed up on it, and it's that little spot in the very center of this image. The colorful stars that you see there are because as we we're tracking on that object, it was moving so fast that the stars, it was changing its position relative to the stars. And so we took three images in red, green, and blue, and uh, then combine them together here. And you can see that little object there. And actually earlier this year, this object uh, moved out beyond the orbit of the moon. Uh, so for a short time, it was a satellite uh, to the earth closer than the moon is to us. So um, it was an interesting object. There was some speculation about what it might be, um, uh, but it was it's probably just a, a small rocky body. Uh, some were saying that it might be a remnant from one of the space missions, uh, but it appears that it's most definitely a, a, a rocky body and not a, not a piece of space, of man-made space debris. Um, this is another observation of a quasar that had uh, tremendously um, high uh, speed and density winds, and so their most energetic winds ever, um, ever observed around a quasar, which a quasar, as, as you probably know, are objects from the very early universe with supermassive black holes in the center, giving off tremendous amounts of energy. Uh, and this one, um, we were able to measure winds that uh, exceeded anything we had ever seen in a quasar before uh, in and around the black hole. Uh, here's a pretty picture of a planetary nebula. I'm going to speed through because we're going to run out of time and not have time for questions. Um, interacting galaxies. So uh, one of the things that we do is, is, um, uh, is we get data and then we put it together into pretty pictures. Uh, the data that comes from the telescope does not look like this when we get it. I don't know, Jesse, if you want to say a little bit about um, maybe what the, what the data does look like. Uh, it can be pretty messy looking when it comes down, but uh, once it's been reduced and analyzed, then we can, we can create things like this, pictures like this. Yeah, that, that's right. And then these are just the images. A lot of times the data just, just look like a bunch of uh, lines and dark spots because they're spectra. But 
but yeah, when when we get the data, it comes in each through each individual filter, and it's and it's just kind of grayscale to us on our screens. I mean, to be fair though, we do get images like this on our screens when we're looking at night that are just gorgeous, and we all think, oh my god, I'm glad I'm you know working in this field or whatever. But they're not in color and they're not reduced like Peter said, so there is a little bit of um, you know, a little bit of. Typically, when the data is taken, to get, it, to get it to look like this, but the data is still, um, you know, they put they put color maps over different filters and things like that. But this is the data from from the telescope. So. Yeah. So this is an interacting galaxy pair. Um, a few other galaxies in there too, but uh, uh, but yeah, once the data is obtained, it can be several months before we analyze it and do what we need to do to to get a pretty picture like this. Um, and lots of times the data will come in and it will be just in one band. Um, it's not generally required that uh, observations um, be done in color or in multiple bands. And so oftentimes we'll have to supplement with another observation to get that extra band so that we can make a color picture of, of it like this. So finally, I wanted to end on this uh, recent um, set of observations. This is the planet Jupiter in uh, the thermal infrared, um, actually 4.7 microns, I think, actually. Um, and it was part of a program with the Juno spacecraft and the Hubble Space Telescope to study weather patterns on Jupiter concurrently or, or with observations all at the same time uh, to better prepare Juno for its uh, encounters with Jupiter. Um, and one of the things that, that, that we were able to do with this data, with these data, were, is to study uh, lightning strikes and the circumstances around lightning strikes and uh, the, 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 where there are holes in the clouds, where there are hot spots in the clouds, and the correlation between weather on, on Jupiter. Um, and here are some of the observations from the Hubble Space Telescope with the Gemini images on the upper, upper right. Um, and uh, to give you a sense of the different types of things that we can see at these different wavelengths. And at the lower right, we've combined the HST and Gemini images there. So you can see that there are actually holes in the clouds and we see down into the deeper layers of the clouds with the Gemini observations. It gives us a, a sort of a 3D picture of the clouds uh, on Jupiter. And um, this final sequence here shows how we got this data. Uh, we didn't use adaptive optics for this. We used something called lucky imaging. And lucky imaging is when you take a whole bunch of very short exposures and then you only use the ones where the atmosphere was behaving itself and giving you a clear view of, of the object. So I'm gonna start the animation. And if you watch on the left-hand side, we're gonna look at different quadrants and you'll see how the clarity of the image changes for the different images. And if you can imagine just taking the very sharpest of them, then you can put them together into the image on the right. So I'll start it now. See how, how much variability there is in the, in the sharpness of the image over time. And again, by being very selective and taking only the sharpest images, uh, we can put together an extremely detailed image of Jupiter. And you can only do this with very bright objects like Jupiter, where you can take really short images and capture those moments of really good seeing when the atmosphere is, is stable. And with that, um, I've wrapped up everything I wanted to share. Hopefully um, it wasn't too quick, but if it was and you want to talk about anything more, I'm happy to stay here as long as, as you are. <laughs> and then Jesse, I don't know what you've got going on, but uh, uh, by all means at this point, uh, if you've got questions, fire away. We'll, we'll try to answer them. <laughs> Peter, could I, could I start with a question? Sure. So um, as we were, you were talking about uh, data reduction and getting nice images, um, so there are various uh, uh, ways to contribute at an observatory and, and to work there. Um, so Jesse manages the um, operations team. So these are the telescope operators. Now, so what, what are their responsibilities? Do they help with data reduction? Yeah, Do absolutely. That's that's a good question, and and you know operations teams at different telescopes do different things. But at Gemini, um, uh, Dad, thanks for bringing it up. It's pretty unique. So, 
we actually we have uh, three different roles in operations, and then we also um, we also do projects around the observatory that that may or may not have to do with operations. But at night, um, you know, there are there are two people in the control room. One is the operator, and one is the observer, and and they can both be from from the same team. Sometimes observers are are astronomers as well, but they could just be from the operations team. Um, the operator takes care of the telescope, uh, makes sure all the systems are working, watches the weather, the the safety um, stuff like that, and the observer is taking the data and running through the queue and actually looking at the data as it comes out. So while we don't reduce the data for the scientists themselves, we do have a quick check and make sure it looks reasonable, um, you know, when it's coming out. And then in the daytime, we have uh, operations staff working as well. Checking, double checking the data from the night before, making sure, checking all the systems and the instruments, making sure they're ready for the night. So there's quite a few things that go into it um, when you observe in a queue based system because we are responsible for taking your data. Basically, we want to make sure we get it right. Um, and then we also have the opportunity to get involved with with other development or software projects around the observatory, you know, based on whatever our interests are. So it's pretty, it's a pretty cool team. So yeah, as REU students, um, we're hoping that you're going to become our staff of the future. Um, and uh, just to give you a, a sense of the the, um, the diversity of, of staff that we have, um, you know, Jesse works with the people that are actually working at night, getting the data, operating the telescope, making sure everything's working correctly and safely. Um, we have science staff that uh, do things like setting up the queue schedule. Um, we try to anticipate what the weather is going to be and what the best uh, observations will be for that night and come up with sort of a choreographed, choreographed list of, of what we're going to try to observe that night and um, or what Jesse's team is going to observe that night. Um, you know, and then we've got a we've got a staff of about 160 people right now between Hawaii and Chile. And again, that includes everything from PhD astronomers um, to uh, large engineering staff, um, information technologies, software development. Uh, we've got educators uh, like ourselves that are doing uh, engagement and community work. Um, we have a news team that's creating press releases and images and uh, uh, and then of course we've got everything from travel support to administrative support uh, so there's a lot of different types of jobs at an observatory uh, far beyond what you might imagine i think about maybe 20 percent of our staff or maybe even a little less are PhD astronomers um, and the rest of support or uh, other functions um, such as, like I said, engineering, information, technologies, uh, IT, all of those sorts of things. So um, anyway, there's, if, you, if you're interested in talking more about that, um, contact us or we can do it now. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I got a um, quick question. So um, with classical scheduling, if the mountain is closed or the weather is not cooperating, then you're just out of luck if you miss it. But with a queue based um, system, you can sort of push things a little bit later. However, given the length of the closures due to COVID, um, are there programs that just aren't going to get time or is there some sort of triage program going on right now? That's a good question. Jesse, you might, do you know the answer to that? Well, uh, vaguely, um, and, and it's kind of changing from day to day, so it's, it's a really good question. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, we were closed down. We're, we're actually back on Sky right now, and we can do that because we operate remotely and because Hawaii has had such a good, uh, well, relative to the rest of the mainland and, and the rest of the world, we've had a pretty low occurrence rate of, of the virus. So we're able to, you know, get back in the control room, back on Sky. But we did lose a couple months, and, um, and it, you're right, it does push the queue back. What happens is when, when the time allocation committees um, are going through the requests, the proposals that, that you guys submit to us or that the researchers submit to us, um, they rank them in terms of, uh, you know, each country ranks them and then the international time allocation committee gets together and ranks them. And they rank them in terms of uh, how beneficial the science outcomes will be. So we, we split them into three bands. Uh, we call band one, band two, and band three. Band one is the highest priority they're guaranteed to get the data no matter what. And if we don't get it this semester, it'll roll over to the next semester and we'll get it when we can. 
Bantu um, is the next priority, and we hope we have very good completion rates. I don't know exactly what they are, but I think they're on the order of 80% or more. Um, and then band three is we'll get it if we can, uh, best you know best effort. If we're having a good semester and you know, or you're lucky with your weather conditions, we'll get your data. And if not, you have to you know, have to make your proposal again next semester. So yes, this COVID situation, just like last year, around the same time when we had um, when we had to shut down because of the the protests on Mauna Kea. So we we lose time, and some of those band three programs are just not going to get executed, and they'll have to propose again the next semester and and hope that hope for the best. But we are very lucky here in Hawaii. Um, we're, uh, Gemini is now part of NOIRA Lab, which is an NSF um, collection of observatories around the world. And some of them are in Kitt Peak and in, in Arizona and in Chile as well, along with Gemini South. And uh, both of those sites have not been able to, to get back on the sky uh, because of COVID. So Hawaii is sort of the exception for, for a lot of observatories right now. Thanks. Okay, if there are, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you all for joining us today. And Jesse, thank you for, for joining uh, in the conversation. Appreciate your, your insights and uh, perspectives on all of this. And um, good luck. Uh, uh, um, all of you students, and again, we hope to, to see you at uh, Gemini as a user someday soon. <laughs> definitely, and all of you, please feel free to email me. Um, I definitely have received some um, some emails from you uh, from some of you uh, on a few questions. Uh, please feel free to do that um, more, and I will make sure that Peter and or Jesse or both. I uh, get those questions if they are uh, depending on who is aimed at. And I would like to say that uh, coming up in in an hour, um, we would have another live from Noir Lab at Gemini. This is our regularly scheduled Wednesday program. And uh, if any of, you, uh, any of you are interested in astrophotography, we will have one of our colleagues from Kitt Peak National Observatory, uh, Robert Sparks, and he'll be uh, speaking on astrophotography. Here he is. Maybe uh, Rob can say a few words. Yes. He's with us right now. Rob, oh, God. Yes, Rob, tell us about it. Yes, I'm, I'm still here, so uh, I was ready for you. Um, yeah, I'll be doing astrophotography in our live from NORA lab this week. Uh, mostly wide field stuff with some uh, stuff, mostly stuff with you can go with either a cell phone or a DSLR with a wide field lens or a zoom lens. So not quite the stuff you're doing, but uh, still some very interesting stuff you can take pretty pictures with and some uh, creative stuff. And I, I describe myself as a bit of a hack because I've never had any formal photography classes or anything like that. So I've just sort of stumbled through and uh, figured out how to do some stuff and had a lot of fun doing it. So I'm gonna talk about that process. Yeah, Rob has some excellent images. I'm looking forward to your program, Rob. Uh, so how can we join that? I just put the link in the oh, chat. Okay. It's gonna be on our Noir Lab YouTube channel. Feel free to uh, join in the YouTube chat. I will be moderating and Alyssa will be uh, hosting, will be hosting Rob. So we, if you can join us, we look forward to, uh, to having you for sure. And feel free to make comments and ask questions. Anything else, Peter? Nope, I'm good. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure um, chatting with you today and um, good luck with your REU experience. Aloha. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Aloha. I, thank you.